Good afternoon. My name is Fundi Chazabana. I'm one of the deputy governors at the South African Reserve Bank, and I moonlight as the CEO of the Prudential Authority. Uh, it is the last session for the day, so we are promising to bring you extra energy so that it does not feel uh, like a drag. We know that it's a very sensitive time zone. Uh, where people who are coming from the east are already in the evening, uh, and those that are from the north are fully awake now because it's morning for them. Uh, so we're hoping to keep you uh, fully attentive during this session. So thinking about mega trends that are driving major structural shifts, uh, the WEF and other institutions have identified three mega trends that are going to drive structural shifts uh, in growth. Demographics is one, climate change is the other, technology is also another one that is top of, of the list. So this afternoon we are going to be focusing on the role of climate change adaptation and mitigation in economic growth. In tackling this topic, I think while we recognize that central banks are not the lead policy makers in climate policy and climate change issues, uh, it is clear that climate change poses significant risks to financial stability and to price stability. And the breadth of the policy risks faced by central bank in dealing with climate change and its consequences is becoming increasingly apparent. Central banks are likely to have to deal with the implications of large structural shifts, more volatile macroeconomic indicators, higher financial stability risks driven by factors such as more frequent uh, and severe droughts and floods, among others, the imposition of uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms and the impacts on uh, funding markets, or simply the uncoordinated actions of governments. Uh, and central banks and regulators are going to have to deal with and tackle uh, these risks. These risks are much larger for us on the African continent, uh, as many economies are more vulnerable to, to climate change risks Due to, due to the larger size of weather-dependent uh, sectors, such as agriculture. We also have underdeveloped financial markets and slow implementation of complex taxonomy, some of it related to disclosure rules, um, and, and we, these will also have significant impact on ESG funding uh, on, on the continent. And many transitional and physical risks facing central banks are directly linked to government policy action uh, or inaction as well. The use of certain instruments can increase the risk of stranded assets, for example. And in this session, we will discuss the use of different government policy instruments to mitigate, which is important for countries in Southern Africa, and how to mobilize uh, more green funding to support our mitigation and adaptation efforts. Uh, we are a smaller panel for this afternoon. Uh, as indicated earlier, Christopher Adam was unable to join us uh, due to health reasons. Uh, I have in my panel, Luigi Damello, who is the director of the policy studies branch uh, at the OECD. Um, and as indicated earlier, most of the CVs are, are included uh, in the pack. Luis and his team in policy studies uh, focus on uh, ensuring the design and implementation of analysis and policies that promote stronger, cleaner, fairer, and inclusive economic growth of members and partner countries in the OECD. And Luis, in his session, will focus on the instruments for climate change mitigation. Our second speaker will be uh, Susie Kerr. Susie is a Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, and Susie is also a leader of the International Climate Actions Team's initiative and a member of advisory boards 
for the Climate uh, Econometrics Group at Oxford, among others. And Susie will focus on climate uh, financing gap challenges. Uh, so let's kickstart the session with Luis. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Fundi, for this uh, uh, excellent introduction to the topic. I think you covered many of the issues that will come up in our presentations and also in the debates that we will follow. Uh, let me also start with a the, with the, with the word of thanks to the Reserve Bank for the invitation. A great pleasure to be here today, great pleasure to be back to Cape Town, to South Africa, and, uh, and congratulations on the uh, organization of this conference, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is great. So uh, uh, with that, let me turn to uh, the uh, issue that, uh, that I would like to, to focus on. It was very good to uh, test a few ideas with, uh, with Fundi, with Chris, with Constantine about uh, some of the issues that uh, would be uh, of interest to you today. I would like really to start off by uh, saying a few words about uh, where we stand on climate change policies. A lot of what I'm going to say is in the light of research that we've been doing. Um, a lot of that focuses on OECD countries, but uh, also uh, in many cases goes beyond that uh, to include um, economies uh, around the world such as, uh, such as South Africa, uh, needless to say. And then I'll focus a bit more on the instruments that policymakers have at their disposal when it comes to climate change mitigation. Uh, I will uh, not have much to say in this presentation about climate change adaptation, but as you said, Fundi, this is also an extremely important part, uh, part of the exercise. And then a few words on possibilities, uh, possible uh, you know, uh, road um, ahead. I think it's very useful to start a conversation about instruments for climate change mitigation uh, by uh, looking at uh, the magnitude of the challenge that we have ahead of us. And I find very useful to refer to the projections that colleagues at the IEA, the International Energy Agency, um, have uh, put together uh, for uh, the uh, globe, for the, the world in terms of emission trajectories uh, between now and the middle of the century. Middle of the century, obviously, because those are the targets that are enshrined in the Paris Agreement. So it's always good to have that type of time frame in mind uh, when you think of the, uh, the challenge ahead. And the gap there between the red line and the uh, uh, green line at the bottom, I think, illustrates this challenge, is how much we would have in terms of emissions uh, if we stay uh, where we are in terms of policy settings uh, and where we would need to go in terms of reduction of emissions to meet uh, the Paris Agreement uh, uh, targets moving forward. You can also see that there is a huge variation uh, among countries in terms of uh, where they are, uh, how far they are from the targets, their own uh, 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 targets, and the direction that they are moving. Some countries are moving in the direction of, uh, of reducing emissions, uh, others not necessarily so. So uh, the magnitude of the challenge for the world as a whole and where countries are going uh, individually given their own agreed, uh, agreed targets. Another issue that is interesting to have in mind when we're talking about climate change mitigation and particularly uh, reducing emissions moving forward is the variation that we also have across countries uh, in terms of economic structure, in terms of the, let's say, uh, what, uh, what, what shapes uh, how much uh, they are uh, emitting uh, today. If you look at the chart on the left, Essentially, you see typically uh, in our economies, the sectors that are uh, the biggest emitters are obviously energy, hence the focus that most countries uh, uh, put uh, on reducing emissions in that sector. But transport, real estate are other sectors that are not too far behind. I'm saying this because it's important to think of climate change mitigation. Uh, as, as, as policies that focus on different aspects of our economy uh, rather than one particular sector, one particular source uh, of emissions. And on the right, you see this variation in the sectoral composition of emissions uh, across countries. You see there, again, huge variation uh, there um, um, across, um, across countries. So with those words of context in mind, uh, what is it that countries can do? 
what are the instruments that they have, again, at their disposal to deal with climate change or to mitigate uh, climate change. I think it's useful to think of a typology of instruments uh, that you can see from this uh, table that essentially distinguishes instruments in terms of those that are price-based, the ones that are not uh, price-based, the ones that are really directly related to climate change uh, mitigation, uh, the ones that may have a bearing on climate change mitigation but are not primarily intended as instruments uh, related to climate policy. So just examples of that. If you think of price-based instruments, you can have the explicit carbon prices, the ones that have to do with emission trading schemes, carbon taxes directly. Uh, you have other price mechanisms uh, related essentially to tradable emissions, to performance standards, uh, to taxes that governments uh, levy on the use uh, of fossil fuels, for example. So all those are price instruments uh, that governments have at their disposal. And then you can think of a host of regulations, standards, norms that are not directly price-based, uh, but also have an impact on, um, on emissions. In some cases, those non-price mechanisms can be uh, important as well, uh, especially in sectors of our economy where price signals may not be uh, as strong, where demand is not as responsive to changes in prices as they may be uh, in terms uh, of, uh, or, or to subsidies, to uh, regulations on standards, uh, and so on. So basically, with this typology of instruments in mind, uh, we can think about uh, you know, where countries are typically, uh, what uh, the evolution has been over time in the use of those different uh, instruments. Let me focus now in the next slide uh, on price-based uh, instruments. The way to read this chart is essentially, well, if you start from the top and you work your way through to the bottom, essentially you're going to go to a narrow definition where we can look at you know, emissions that are priced using emission trading schemes, then emissions that are priced on the basis of carbon taxes, explicit carbon taxes, then you can go on and look at emissions that are priced uh, through uh, taxes uh, on the use of uh, uh, fossil fuels, for instance, excises that most of our economies uh, have on the use of uh, gasoline, deals, diesel, and other, and other fuels. What we can see uh, with this is that over time, and I'm not going back to prehistory, just focusing on pre-pandemic and uh, our latest uh, observations, is that the percentage of emissions that are priced using those instruments uh, has gone up. We could think of uh, pre-pandemic at something in the range of 35% of emissions that were priced, uh, just above, a uh, little above that, uh, to something that is close to 50% of emissions that are priced. So an evolution over time, an increase in the use of price mechanisms uh, to mitigate um, emissions, but also to have in mind that those effective carbon rates, so not ex only the explicit rates or taxes applied uh, on emissions, but also those levies on uh, the use of fossil fuels, uh, are relatively low. So an increase in the use of the instrument, but still relatively low prices. If you think again at the uh, most, the broadest definition there, explicit tri uh, um, um, taxes on carbon and uh, uh, f uh, taxes on fossil fuels, you see that we went for about, I know, something that was just above 15 euros per ton of carbon dioxide to something that is just short of 20 euros per ton of carbon dioxide. So, small increase in price, a bigger increase in the share of emissions that are covered by prices. And why is that the case? Well, because we still have a large chunk of emissions uh, that are not priced, if you look at this chart, about 50% of emissions are not priced at all. Another 25% of emissions that are priced but at relatively low levels. And then, you know, a very narrow percentage, a small percentage of emissions that are more heavily taxed. And the bulk of that, the lighter part uh, of, the, of the bars to the right, 
Now, essentially not explicit carbon taxes, uh, but uh, taxes levied on the use of fossil fuels. So, so that explains uh, why essentially um, average effective carbon rates remain relatively low despite this increase in, um, in, um, in um, uh, taxes, in the use of this instrument uh, over time. I've already said that, but if you look at where, what sectors of the economy, uh, which ones are more heavily taxed, then you can see that by far road transport, the uh, first line there in the chart, is the sector that is most heavily taxed. And it's no surprise that the sectors where uh, those uh, effective carbon rates are higher are the sectors that have lower emissions uh, on average. So you see that those price signals uh, do uh, operate in a way uh, that tends to reduce emissions uh, as you increase the cost or the price uh, of emissions uh, uh, in general. Let me give you also uh, an illustration of the variation that we have across countries uh, in the um, average effective carbon rates, average in terms of across the economy in individual countries. And then you'll see that countries that have relatively high um, share of emissions uh, that are priced, relatively high prices on emission, and the countries towards the bottom of the table where prices are still relatively low, in many cases because of a chunk of emissions in those countries that remain unpriced, as I mentioned a minute ago. If you look, for instance, at individual sectors in the economy, just to give you an example, take the case of real estate, of buildings, uh, that I mentioned earlier on, that is also uh, a large emitter in our economies, and you see that there are also issues uh, of uh, uh, very different rates or very different prices that apply to the different uses of energy in those sectors. If you look at the left, for example, you see that the, um, uh, the uh, effective carbon rates on electricity used indirectly in buildings, so whatever we needed to basically make sure that appliances uh, work, uh, those emissions are priced very differently from the direct use of energy, for example, in our buildings. So just to illustrate the fact that it's not only the coverage of the mechanisms that are in place, not only the actual prices that are levied in different uses, uh, but also the fact that uh, across, in the same sector, you may have discrepancies uh, in how uh, uh, emissions are priced uh, depending on the use of energy that is made in those, uh, in those sectors. We also carried out some work looking at, for example, what, what would happen if countries essentially apply the flat floor uh, of, uh, for example, 60 euros uh, per ton uh, across sectors uh, in the economy. You could see that on the basis of the elasticities that we know, that we have estimated with some certainty, um, that would lead to a reduction in emissions. Uh, that reduction will be higher in countries where obviously emissions are currently priced at lower uh, levels. And that would also, uh, if you did this type of exercise, you could see directly that it could generate revenue uh, for the governments that could be used uh, in other areas uh, of climate change uh, policies. I'm mentioning this because there are many instruments uh, that governments have at their disposal that could you know, create a claim for government budgets. If you are subsidizing innovation, green innovation, for example, that will have a cost to the budget. Well, if you uh, are using instruments that at the same time generate some revenue, you could do that. If you wanted to make sure that you support vulnerable social groups that may be affected adversely during the transition, uh, that's revenue that can be uh, recycled if you want uh, in that respect. Obviously, an important point to bear in mind is that those revenues are temporary, you know, to the extent that uh, uh, pricing uh, of emissions leads to a reduction in emissions, of course, those revenues will come down as well. So should be seen uh, essentially a revenue that could be raised in the course of the transition, but not a permanent source uh, of, uh, of revenue for the budget. How is it affecting? So, so far I've just spoken essentially about those price-based mechanisms and how they have evolved uh, over time. How is it affecting basically the overall 
uh, environmental policies or policy settings uh, in a given country. And this is exercise, this is an indicator that we have at the OECD that tries to measure the stringency of environmental policies uh, across countries. It's an indicator that focuses es essentially um, on air pollution and emissions uh, of greenhouse gases, covers about 34 countries uh, over the next, the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, but also in, you know, focuses in, on, on market and on non-market uh, and technology support mechanisms. So just one indicator to give you an idea of how this evolution in the use of pricing price-based mechanisms has impacted overall um, environmental policies in a country. And then you can see, if you compare the bars and the diamonds there, is that for the bulk of the countries, uh, yes, it has contributed, especially the market-based ones, uh, to uh, greater, higher standards, if you want, uh, in environmental policies uh, as, as well. Here you have a variation across countries in this indicator. I showed you in the previous slides essentially the averages uh, over time, but you can see how it has, uh, uh, um, um, how it applies uh, to, uh, 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 to this evolution um, over time. We can see increase in the use of market-based instruments, also an increase in non-market-based instruments uh, as well. So not only pricing that is being used, but other instruments as well. But what is an interesting development there is that uh, in terms of technology support, we see that that trend has, has essentially uh, plateaued uh, over the last, um, uh, the last uh, 10 years. Why am I mentioning this? Well, a lot uh, in terms of you know, efforts to reduce abatement costs will have to come from technology changes, adoption of uh, green technologies, not only development in terms of R&D, uh, but also support for the deployment of those technologies for basically uh, make sure that they are adopted, that they can uh, be upscaled and, 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 and lead to sustained reductions in, uh, in prices. So a word there saying that uh, this is an area that probably deserves some monitoring uh, going forward um, uh, in, in terms of the impact of these policies as well. Let me mention uh, a couple of things about, uh, about the trade-offs and synergies that uh, we can think of across those different instruments. Because we have you know, a variety of instruments, it's important to think of the relative, the pluses and minuses, the relative strengths and weaknesses of the different instruments. Not going to go through the whole table, but just mention the criteria that policymakers can have in mind when thinking of their policy mixes. And I wanted to insist here on this point, is that if you have a variety of instruments, it makes sense to think of policy packages, ones that would combine different instruments depending on their potential to reduce emissions, depending on the costs associated with those, uh, with those instruments as well. So looking at the potential for minimizing abatement costs, both in the short term and in the long term, that's an interesting criteria, criterion for policy choice. Thinking of administrative costs as well to implement those measures. Thinking of the ability to deal with uncertainty. I think there were lots of uh, points that were raised in the course of the day uh, to highlight the need for certainty uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Potential for reallocation and distributional concerns. So basically looking at the uh, asymmetries that may exist across sectors and within sectors across different types of firms, different types of households that are affected in the course of the transition by the use of these instruments. That's again an important criterion uh, for policy. Issues related to the political economy, we see that some instruments, and perhaps we can come back to that in the debate, some of those instruments are more politically acceptable than others. Societies have different perceptions about uh, the costs and the benefits of different instruments. So also important uh, to look at that uh, uh, as well. And the issue that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, is there a scope for uh, raising uh, revenue uh, by using the instruments, even though raising revenue is not the primary objective of that, but if you can raise revenue, how you can recycle uh, that revenue. So just an illustration of the type of considerations, the type of criteria that policymakers uh, can, um, uh, um, uh, uh, can take into account uh, when uh, designing their policy packages. I gave the example of buildings a minute ago, just to illustrate some of the measures that we are seeing around the world, this is just, you know, just a handful of cities. A lot of these regulations, those non-market-based, non-price-based instruments, 
are often under the purview of uh, local governments, regional governments. And you can see here lots of uh, efforts uh, in terms of taxes uh, for the direct use of energy uh, in the sector, uh, policies that have to do with subsidizing, for instance, uh, or incentivizing uh, the adoption uh, of um, you know, better uh, um, uh, more efficient technologies uh, in uh, home appliances, uh, investments in uh, in energy retrofitting old uh, houses that can have that can be much less energy efficient uh, than others. Issues related to standards and regulations in building codes that can lead again to greater energy efficiency in the use of buildings. So just to illustrate that uh, in many cases, a lot of these uh, non-price based mechanisms can have a very powerful impact uh, or effect on behavior, on investment, uh, investments that may be needed to uh, contribute to reduction in, uh, in the use of energy. In that, uh, in that sector. To wrap up, let me mention uh, a few elements or a few considerations that, uh, uh, that I hope you will find also useful in thinking about next steps uh, in this area. I think it's fair to say that there is a need to uh, make progress on several fronts here. One, to improve the global understanding and the comparability of policy, the effects of policy measures. Different instruments, how they impact emissions, the economic or social costs that may be associated with the use of different instruments. So we still need to uh, have a much better understanding of that, much more solid modeling, uh, much better documentation uh, of those potential abatement impacts or so economic costs of the different uh, instruments. Um, another uh, area is how can we assess more uh, empirically with greater certainty um, the, for instance, the climate policy performance, the commitments that countries uh, have uh, um, uh, entered into. Uh, in a way that allows for comparability of different experiences across the world that can be used then to inform policy uh, design. The issue about uh, cooperation, uh, about uh, identification of good practices that can be then uh, used once again to inform policy making uh, in this uh, uh, area. How we can also use that base of evidence, indicators, data, evidence, uh, to, um, uh, to create uh, basically a better understanding and to drive uh, ambition uh, around the world uh, in the area of climate change uh, uh, mitigation. Final word of how we are at the OECD contributing to this. I think in many of those areas, we are already uh, working with our partners, working with our member countries, working with the policy communities uh, that uh, uh, we support. Uh, to advance on this, to advance on the, uh, um, uh, on the analytics of climate change mitigation, on the evidence base of climate change mitigation, creating inventories of climate policies uh, you know, across the typology that I mentioned. Um, trying to map those uh, uh, climate policies or mitigation policies onto different types of uh, uh, emissions, how much abatement potential they all have, uh, build on the evidence that we have already around the world where we don't have good evidence and there are many areas uh, where there are gaps, how we can basically then uh, um, uh, you know, improve methodologies, improve the base of evidence uh, that uh, policymakers can have at their, uh, at their disposal. Measuring then uh, how those uh, different uh, uh, instruments uh, can affect uh, not only, again, emissions in different parts of the world, but also how they affect their economies uh, at large. Building on sectoral models, understanding how they relate to aggregate uh, models uh, for entire economies, trying to bridge those gaps is part of an exercise that we have uh, at the OECD, a project that we call the Inclusive Forum on Carbon Mitigation Approaches uh, that can help uh, collectively the world advance in some of these, uh, in these areas. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll stop here, Fundi, and, uh, and look very much forward to, uh, to uh, not, not only to hear from you about your, uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, you consider to be uh, important considerations here, but also you know, working more broadly with South Africa in these, uh, in these uh, initiatives that can help uh, you know, the whole world uh, uh, design better, better policies uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change on our economies and societies. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Susie. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko otaki taku awa. Ko maunga whao taku maunga. Ko Susie ko au. In New Zealand, Aotearoa, where I'm from, it's traditional to introduce yourself in Māori, our indigenous language. I'm extremely grateful to be here today. Uh, so thank you very much to the South African Reserve Bank. Um, I also come here with deep respect for what South Africa has achieved uh, in terms of creating a stronger, fairer rainbow nation. And New Zealand has had the privilege of having an extremely small role in that. And I hope that we can work together uh, on another global challenge that we now face, uh, climate change. And in order to solve this problem, uh, if we do not solve it, we'll have devastating impacts for everything we have achieved for our people. We're going to have to bring all of our humanity, our imagination, and our intelligence to solve this problem. So there's a challenging finance gap uh, to, to get through to a clean transition to achieve the uh, mitigation goals that Luis just laid out. So these are estimates from the uh, Climate Finance Initiative. Uh, the total finance needed for clean transition annually of around 4.3 trillion. There are different estimates. Uh, they're all on the same order of magnitude. Uh, but a finance gap of around 3.7 trillion. So those small bars at the bottom are the existing finance, public, private, uh, and voluntary market that are already contributing there. So we have a huge problem. Uh, and sorry, these are the wrong slides. These are the wrong slides. Okay. I'm sorry, this would be really challenging. These are like a week old. A week old? I Let me just check. Constantine, are you able today. to help us? Um, okay. Um, perhaps while we transition, uh, Susie, yeah. you can have a seat. We, do the uh, we, can, we can reverse. I've got some, some questions while they are transitioning. As soon as your slides are up, we will uh, we'll, we'll return to that. Uh, so, Luis, in your slides, you, you touched on you know, the political economy trade-offs, and, and I think it's useful for us to reflect on, on those type of issues, uh, particularly in the context of emerging market countries. And, uh, and Susie, I'll, I'll add that for you to, to reflect on as well, uh, given the first slide that, that we <laughs> saw, which is on the, the climate financing gap. Um, so, so one of the challenges that, that comes across when, when you're in an emerging market country is the debate of how much of a priority should this be. So if you're dealing with inequality, if you're dealing with a whole other host of policy imperatives, how much of time should you be giving uh, to this work? Uh, particularly when they are competing resources. So we're talking about the pricing of carbon. We're talking about selling a narrative around carbon prices, pricing, and some of that might be through taxation instruments. Uh, so any thoughts there or any advice that, that you have to give, uh, to, give to us? And, and I found it particularly interesting, your slides focus on the large um, amount of carbon that is not priced currently because of industries. And um, yeah, so your thoughts on, on that for emerging market countries in particular. Uh, and Susie, as we get to your slides, I, I often wonder whether too much focus on climate finance is an enabler or a, dis or a disabler for emerging market countries uh, if the approach is saying, we will wait for the climate finance to come and then act later. Uh, but Luis, let's, let's start with you. Th thanks, Fundi. This is a, this is a great, uh, great question. Uh, let me uh, make a couple of points here. Uh, I mean, one is that obviously that the priorities differ across countries. No? Um, and, uh, but I don't think that uh, one can think of uh, climate change or addressing the challenges of climate change as a luxury. 
Um, you mentioned yourself earlier on um, the risks of physical, uh, the physical risks, if you want, you know, associated with natural disasters moving forward. Uh, many of the developing countries and emerging markets economy will suffer the most for uh, reasons that have to do with where they are located, their geography, the climate uh, conditions uh, that, uh, that apply in those, uh, in those countries. This is a mega trend. I think all of the world needs to be concerned with that. The other point that I found interesting is that we did some work um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, essentially um, conducting a survey of attitudes and perceptions about climate change mitigation policies. And we had advanced economies, we had emerging market economies in that sample. And it was interesting to see that some of the attitudes uh, were not very different mm -hmm. across countries. To give you an example, uh, obviously pricing mechanisms are not the most popular, as you can mm -hmm. imagine. No, when people think that they are going to have to pay you know, higher taxes on the use of fuels, uh, they typically don't like it, and that was the case for advanced economies and for emerging market economies. But the situation changed um, in a very interesting way when we asked people, again about their attitudes, but knowing what use was going to be made of the revenues that would be raised uh, if governments applied that or those instruments. That's why I insisted so much in that slide mm -hmm. about the revenue. Uh, and then the, res the, the responses were much more nuanced, again in emerging market economies and advanced economies. Huh? Uh, if people were reassured that the money would be used to support vulnerable social groups, mm -hmm. to improve public transport networks, to subsidize green innovation, they were much more prepared to accept to pay higher prices mm -hmm. for emissions than in situations where either they didn't know what use was going to be made of the resources uh, or that the use was going to be different than those associated right. with climate change uh, mitigation. So I'm saying this not to underestimate the, the political economy uh, challenges mm -hmm. that, that all countries would face here, uh, but to add a level of nuance that uh, depending on how you design your policies, how you communicate those policies to society, uh, attitudes may change. And that's an important thing, uh, uh, point to, to make. I live in Paris, and you probably all heard about the riots that Paris uh, had at the time mm -hmm. that the government uh, increased or tried to increase uh, taxes on fossil fuels. Yes. So this was a political economy issue in a part of the world where there was a specific context for that type of reaction. So uh, we all have in our different countries, uh, you know, uh, areas where we needed to work more on the political economy. Uh, but that nuance, I think it's useful to make. Mm -hmm. uh, any reflections that you want to uh, make, Susie? I, I, you've got to give yeah. us uh, a hint. Don't get into your presentation <laughs> yet. I'll try we, not to. We, we will, no. we will still get back to it. A, a few thoughts. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first one is that we don't stop climate change until we get to net zero globally. Mm. And 75% of the mitigation that needs to happen by 2030 is going to be in developing countries. So if we don't work out how to make this in developing countries, the people who are going to lose most are the people in those very same developing countries. Mm. So we do have to solve this problem on the ground. Second thought is that it doesn't have to be done by the developing countries working on their own. So we do need to work together to be able to address that and bring some of that resource. We certainly shouldn't wait for that because realistically, these resources will have to come from everywhere that they are available to make that happen. But the third very positive thing, I think, is that I've been working on climate change for probably 30 years now. And it used to be that it was initially infeasible to stop climate change. We didn't have the technology. And then it was feasible but very costly. But now we are at the point that for many economies and in many places, renewable energy is actually just the cheapest option. And 
the technologies continue to improve. So there's much less of a tension between economic resilience and addressing climate change than there was even two years ago, even five years ago, and certainly 10 years ago. So this is becoming an opportunity uh, that is much more real. We've always talked about leapfrogging and development and so on, but it is really mm -hmm. becoming something real. And particularly for a country like South Africa, where the electricity stability is a huge issue, and that's a very common problem, mm -hmm. this is a, a possibility to move forward in that space. Okay, on that note, On that Susie, note, we, sorry. we're back on track, <laughs> thanks. I apologise if that was my confusion for that. Let's move that forward. Excellent. I'm sorry, it's not moving. Yes. So, uh, we are beginning, finally, just in the last couple of years, to get a surge in renewable energy investment and investment in electric vehicles. So, I'm very optimistic about that. We may be heading towards a tipping point in some parts of the global economy, but this is, uh, with the exception of China, this is not really happening in uh, emerging markets and developing countries. So as you can see in this picture on the left, you're seeing the share of global population that is in emerging markets and developing economies, and not, which is two thirds. And on the far right, you're seeing the clean energy investment, which is obviously woefully low. So this is a challenge that we need to resolve. So carbon markets are one part of the potential solution which has not been used very actively so far. There's a lot of experience with carbon pricing markets, et cetera, within countries that Louise has talked about. So we've learned an enormous amount about that. But markets across countries are really only beginning to evolve. And some of our early experiences with those through things like the clean development mechanism or the voluntary carbon market have not been roaring successes. But again, we have learned a lot. We're learning as we go here. So carbon market, I think of in a very broad sense, not the carbon market that some of you might think of, which is project-based trades between corporates and, and local communities, but a mechanism that transfers resources from those who have to those who need for mutual benefit, like all markets, um, and to increase climate ambition. So you have on the one hand a developing country which is deeply concerned about climate change, but has low wealth. They also have a relatively low economic cost to accelerate climate change because it hasn't been able to be a priority. They have many more pressing local priorities. There is political resistance to local action because it has big impacts on some groups. But overall, they're willing to act, but they're constrained by the resources. They need more money, they need skills, they need technology, and they need political support to make it possible to make uh, decisions that are unpopular with some powerful groups. And then on the other side, you have countries in the European Union, New Zealand, Australia, have high concern also, they, but they have high wealth. And because they have been acting on climate change for a while, they've implemented quite a few policies and they now face a high cost to accelerate climate ambition beyond where they are now. So they can transfer some resources from instead of doing, trying to do more in their own countries, accelerating a transition that would be very expensive, they can transfer resources, including skills and technology, to developing countries who can then go faster, and that helps both countries. But also, the developed countries face a lot of political resistance to moving money offshore. Every country has needs locally, we all have groups that are disadvantaged. There are always priorities for spending domestically. So it's very hard to persuade voters to spend billions of dollars in another country where they would see that as a form of aid, even though this is not aid, this is about markets. But we need to make sure that people understand that this is enlightened self-interest, that we can't solve the climate problem unless we help to solve it in developing countries. And people are willing to contribute if they have the confidence that their contributions will really make a difference. <laughs> 
So jointly, we can also provide political cover for each other, political support that we're not doing this alone, that this is something we're doing with other countries who, who our own citizens trust and respect. So international carbon markets can help to fill that enormous finance gap in the simple way that carbon revenues raise the returns on clean investment, as well as getting renewable electricity from a renewable facility, you also get to sell carbon reductions. There are a number of sources of international demand for carbon credits. There's the voluntary carbon market, which in the United States is, is roaring, uh, and there's a lot of activity. But there are also compliance carbon markets, and they have the potential to be much larger. So these can be through Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, where, for example, the EU could pay South Africa to uh, mitigate more rapidly. Or they can be Corsia, which is the agreement for um, international aviation. And the credits can come from two very different sorts of approaches. One is the traditional approach, which is projects, where you look at a particular facility and you say, we will build a solar field instead of building a coal plant, and we'll work out what the emission reductions are from that, and that generates the credits. Historically, those have been very common, uh, and they're still, they're still being used a lot today. But the other approach, which is more economics-based and which is uh, emerging, um, particularly in uh, it's being used for avoided deforestation, is to look at a sectoral level or a jurisdiction, which could be a political jurisdiction. And those approaches look at what the emissions would be in that sector as a whole and create a baseline from that, and then they motivate sectoral change uh, throughout a sort of systemic sectoral change and measure the emission reductions at that level. They are beginning to be implemented effectively for forests, uh, they, but they could equally be, well be used for something like the energy sector. So carbon markets also have some attractive qualities in terms of addressing the, the, the finance gap. So Carbon markets are not a commodity market, although lots of people talk about them that way. They largely are bespoke trades. So you can design a contract between the buyer and seller in such a way that there might be advanced payments, which can be used to de-risk investments, which is extremely valuable. Um, for example, the political risk or some of the delivery risks. Uh, they can pay for things like insurance, uh, or they can take on an equity stake, which then enables more standard um, private sector investments to proceed. They can also involve pricing that shares the carbon price risk, both, both the risk that prices are lower than anticipated, but also the upside, um, making sure that if there are high carbon prices, then both sides of the trade uh, can benefit from that. Sectoral agreements have an advantage that they're not only investing in specific physical um, projects, but they can also support the things that are critical for system change. The barriers to decarbonisation now are often not the profitability of the facility itself, it's often things like having adequate labour, so having training programmes, uh, having social protection for people who might lose their jobs uh, and, and need to make a transition to a new job electricity reforms. We're dealing with sectors here that are highly regulated. So simply building new facilities is not sufficient. So if we can get these carbon markets to work well, they raise the returns, they can manage the risk better, and they can create a supportive economic environment, and that then mobilizes the private capital. And people talk a lot about climate finance in the United Nations, but the vast majority of capital that is needed for the climate transition has to come from the private sector because that's where the money is. So what I've done here is a very simple scenario of what you could do that would fill this, this, this um, gap. You'll notice a tiny green patch at the top that I couldn't fill, and I've been quite optimistic, so we need some more creativity in this space. So that top uh, blue piece comes from modelling that was done by Perez Cabezas et al. Also has been done by the International Emissions Trading Association, essentially saying if we had a perfectly operating 
carbon market between countries, how much, how much capital would be mobilised by those trades? And that's the, the blue part up there. The yellow part is projections of what the voluntary capital, sorry, the voluntary carbon market might be able to mobilise, so small but, but valuable. That grey piece is an extrapolation of the current trends that we're seeing in public finance. So this is multilateral development banks, um, ODA, etc. That orange part is the capital that could be mobilised by domestic carbon pricing instruments. Taxes, ETS, fuel excise, or anything that essentially creates a marginal price on carbon within a country. Um, there can be overlap, of course, between these. It might be that the trades between countries are used to support the carbon pricing to to reduce the social opposition, make this uh, a worthwhile thing for the whole of society. And that part in blue at the bottom is uh, private capital that is being mobilised, that is not driven by any form of regulation or carbon pricing. It may be um, that it's simply becoming profitable or it could be driven by other forms of regulation. So what you can see in this picture, which you know, should be be taken very much as a scenario, is that the international transfers have to play a very important role, unless you're extremely optimistic about the public financing and how much it can leverage. Um, it can complement the public funding, and the two do definitely need to work together, but the public funding on its own is extremely unlikely to be sufficient. And the domestic compliance pricing is also uh, very important and can be supported by these international transfers. So the Climate Policy Initiative, which is uh, an extremely good finance group, they provided the data um, that I used earlier, they have three recommendations of what is needed to fill this finance gap. So the first is that we take holistic sectoral strategies. So we move away from focusing on uh, just solving individual problems of transmission or grid or building a few renewables plants and we think about the whole sector and how the people within it have to actually shift. The second is that we shift to a new finance paradigm. So instead of having aid projects and uh, multilateral development project projects and then private projects and philanthropic projects, we integrate them into packages so that we use them in the most effective ways possible to complement each other. And third, that we desperately need policies that create enabling environments for the private finance. And that can involve reducing technology costs. So things like the uh, United States Inflation Reduction Act, if it is investing heavily in trying to get technology costs down, as well as supporting US uh, manufacturing, promoting innovation, scaling the proven technologies to the point where not only are they cheaper, but we have the skills base so that we can roll them out effectively, creating predictable environments uh, for accelerating net zero transition. And I guess the last is something where reserve bankers have a particular expertise and knowledge about how to stabilise those investment environments and make that attractive. So uh, we have two things that we really need to have holistic uh, sectoral strategies. So the first is that we have to have some idea of where it is we're actually trying to go. We need a vision of where we're trying to transition to. So modelling is extremely valuable in this because it allows us to explore the future. Not because it's predictive, but because it can tell us what's possible and what's very unlikely. And using modelling alongside engagement with a wide group of people can develop some buy-in to the sorts of actions that are, are essential and that are attractive and inevitable during these processes. The second is that we need to develop a lot of trust. Trust in the direction we're going so that people have the confidence to invest and trust so that countries like my country are confident that they can invest in countries like yours. We also need strong policies um, because these are significant economic shifts. They're unlikely to happen without policy. And between countries, strong contracts uh, to be able to transfer cash, capital and capability on the scale that we need. 
So I think of this as a mitigation avocado, and hopefully this will keep you awake at this late time in the afternoon. So there's a seed, there's the flesh, and there's the skin. And we can put them together, these different scales of effort and different types of effort, into a delicious package of policies that makes uh, voters, makes uh, private sector, makes government willing to support the overall package and that then that mobilizes the private sector action. So according to some modeling, the electricity sector and transition in the electricity sector could produce 50% of the emission reductions that we need globally in 2030. And also we need clean energy clean electricity in order to electrify industry and buildings and other activities. So electricity is absolutely central here. So what does the avocado look like for electricity? So electricity, just for some examples, we need to build renewable plants, we need to train workers, we need to electrify industry so that there are users for that electricity, and ultimately we're going to need to close coal-fired power stations. We need resources to do that. We need finance. We need support for the communities who are going to have to go through this transition. We need to enhance our local grid infrastructure. And we need a lot of human capability to construct and to manage these renewable systems. So we need to start building that now. And those resources to do that can come from a variety of places. So there are co-benefits from these activities, and that can mobilise resources at a local scale uh, from local governments or from, from federal governments. But there are also uh, rewards that, that will be associated. So uh, that could come from government policy through pricing of renewable electricity after uh, electricity reforms. It could come internationally through carbon credit projects, uh, thinking about building renewables facilities, and it could just simply be forced through regulation. Some countries are taking that approach. But as any gardener knows, it's not enough just to plant a seed. You have to create the environment in which those seeds are nourished and can flourish. So we need to change the system at a higher level. We need to reform regulation to make it possible to build profitable, renewable electricity and make sure that it actually gets dispatched at the right times. We need to build infrastructure. We need to manage a highly renewable grid. We now know how to do that technically, but we don't necessarily have the, the skilled workers out there uh, in, in position to do that. We need to enable renewable siting, which in some countries is a very challenging thing. So again, we have resource needs. Uh, we have just transition needs at a global, at a, at a sorry, a national scale, um, partly to avoid the political crises, but also just to make this a fairer transition and leave no one behind. We need to cover policy design costs. And in the scheme of things, that's not a lot of money, but as all of you know, governments are always constrained in terms of their capability. And here again, there are some really strong incentives that make this worthwhile. So having stable, reliable electricity that enables growth is, is an enormous benefit that could come out of this. Countries have their own nationally determined contributions, that's their commitments under Paris, so this will help to achieve those. And also, it would be possible to have sectoral carbon crediting so that other countries are rewarding uh, developing countries for actually making these sectoral transitions, and that's what I'll talk a little more about. So putting this together, the seeds, the building the renewable facilities, and then the system changes, you end up with a package of activities that can really lead to significant change. And you can stack the capital and the different revenue sources, if you're clever, using good financial engineering to create packages that, that really work. So I want to move now to some thoughts that we've been developing for a number of years about the sort of the how. How do you make these markets really work? Because international carbon markets are something economists have talked about for a long time, and they still have really not achieved their potential. So there's a group of us have been working, um, a group of academics working with policymakers, particularly in Chile, New Zealand, and Switzerland, 
to try and road test some ideas and develop some better models for how we could do this going forward. So if you take an example of a country like South Africa, and I'm not talking specifically that South Africa would do this, but just to use a concrete example, the fundamental challenge with climate change is that it's a public good and that we've got a cooperation problem in providing it. So fundamentally, we have a problem of game theory. And we know that it is much easier to cooperate, to achieve cooperation, if you're dealing with a small group of players. So the first part of the idea is that rather than trying to have a generalized set of rules at the international level, you create mini lateral deals where South Africa would choose some countries that they would like to work with and who would like to work with them and who they feel that they could develop a, a good, strong, trusting relationship to go forward. And then we design uh, contractual arrangements using contract theory ideas that align all the incentives all the way through the chain for the buyer, for the seller, for the investment, for the delivery, uh, for the purchase of the credits once they have been delivered, for the prices that get delivered, so that all of the incentives are aligned to make this a solid, fair, uh, effective trade. So the first characteristic is that it's results-based. So there is actually an incentive to to follow through on the changes and make sure that they are genuinely effective. The second is that it's large scale. So large scale, by large scale, I mean that it's at a national scale or a multi-sectoral or for something like the electricity sector, it's so big it could just be uh, the electricity sector on its own. It's also long term because what we're trying to do is get investment. So having a short-term agreement is not going to mobilise investment, it's going to mobilise very short-term actions that can later be reversed. And because it's large scale, it allows the country that is receiving the, the credit revenue to use whatever policies and actions are most effective in that country. It's not defining what the country has to do. South Africa as an example, works out what will be most effective and politically possible here, and those are the policies that get supported by the package. We pull countries, a lot of people say, why don't you just do this bilaterally? And essentially, it's because you want to go deep. In order to be confident that real change has happened, you need to do it on a large scale. And all of you do econometrics, I'm sure, and you know how difficult it is to separate signal from noise. So we need to have a large enough signal that we are confident that the efforts that we're making from the point of view of the buyer and the seller are really actually accelerating climate ambition. And so you need to be bringing in a lot of finance, you need to be bringing in a lot of resources, including capability, training, et cetera, in order to really shift the system. And that's much easier to do if you have multiple countries involved. And finally, this is not just about a commercial relationship. And this is something we've very much learned from crediting relationships within countries. That if you have actual relationships between people and the people trust each other and they build a relationship between themselves, it's much more likely to be taken seriously and to endure. If it's just about the money, the moment the money stops or looks risky, the whole thing begins to fall apart. And these approaches, whatever, and some of these sorts of deals are being developed now, they need to be developed in collaboration with the multilateral development banks so that these activities are additive or super additive rather than, than just being separate. And also with the private sector community who complain that they're often brought in after the fact and the instruments have been designed in ways that don't really work for them. So what does this look like in a sort of a, a functional sense? So this graph shows time against national or sectoral level emissions. So it starts with modeling. So you need modeling that is open, that is transparent, that can be seen by the buyer, by the seller, by people in the community, that establishes what a reasonable business as usual forecast is or a counterfactual, and then models what it will take to achieve uh, an autonomous contribution, or uh, in this case, it might be the national 
nationally determined contribution and uses that to create a crediting baseline so that if the country, the host country, can reduce emissions further, they get rewarded for it. And then the emissions are measured. We already emis measure emissions within countries. We use um, IPCC-based measures uh, for national inventories. We can enhance those uh, and also use other data sources. You're measuring at a sectoral level, so the measuring burden isn't nearly as great as it would be otherwise. And then the gap between the two, and obviously I've borne this very optimistically so that I can fit the words in, um, but that's the additional reductions that actually get credited. And if you can have deep reductions, that can be a significant flow of resources. So as a contract, what this is, so we've got these countries who are the ones that South Africa has chosen to work with. They first are dedicating their climate finance, for example, the JETP, uh, to South Africa, and that gets the ball rolling. That starts activity on the ground so that you start to see shifts towards reductions in emissions. But then you have an additional agreement, and that agreement has a minimum price that is guaranteed. So it's not like the clean development mechanism where a lot of people created reduction projects, and by the time they actually matured and began to produce reductions, the market had collapsed, and so they weren't worth anything. A lot of people got badly burned. So this would be a binding contract that does guarantee a minimum price, but it also provide some protection for the buyer because buyer countries like New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland are beginning to panic that they're not going to be able to meet their Paris commitments because there won't be anyone to buy high integrity credits from. And the price of those good quality credits might completely skyrocket as we get close to 2030, if we're lucky. We kind of hope that that's what's going to happen. But by making these contracts in advance, that protects those buyers against those extremely high prices. So you have a floor and you have a ceiling, but you have some sharing of both the opportunity and the risks in between those two. But the other thing is that it's not just about price, it's committing to how much you will actually spend. Because there's no value in selling credits for $100 a ton if you're only able to sell a few. And that's been one of the challenges with the project mechanisms is that they just don't scale up. So you would also be committing, if, these, if the host country is successful, to be buying a really large volume of credits. And that money would be committed, conceivably it would go literally into a fund, uh, but it wouldn't be released until you observe the actual changes, and that provides the security for the buyers of the credits. And the whole thing, because remember we are in a cooperation game here, the whole thing depends on transparency. You need external observers to be able to look at the trade and say with confidence that France, UK and US have actually bought something that was real and they should be given some level of credit for that when they come back and report to the United Nations and to the other countries. So otherwise, if they don't have that confidence that they'll get acknowledgement, they are not going to actually provide the resources in the first place. So we need to bring the same energy, respect, uh, intelligence, that we have brought to things like the Springboks playing the All Blacks to my devastation on the weekend. If we can bring that sort of energy to solving climate together as well, we, we really have hope. So some key thoughts to take away. First, holistic approach. We can't think about this on the margin anymore. We have to think about the system shift. Second, we have to use all the sources and all the instruments in order to fill the climate gap. We shouldn't be fighting over which one will be more effective. We need all of them. And third, we need international support both at the local level but also at that system or sectoral level. The action that needs to happen going forward is increasingly going to be in the south. And something that distresses me is that we are still not seeing enough leadership from the South in how you want that to actually happen. And South Africa has taken some critical leadership, so thank you for that, and I hope we can continue in that together. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So thank you, Susie, for, for that presentation. So back to the question that I asked at the beginning. Is finance an enabler or a disabler, potentially? Uh, but, but the context that I want to present is as follows. So if I listen to what both you and Luis have presented, you talk about having a co like comprehensive policy package. So this is about structural reforms. So in thinking about climate finance and where it fits in, I think the question I have for you from a developing country context is what should be coming first? Does it mean that the reforms have to happen ahead of finance coming in and the investment coming in? So just to help in, in framing the thinking around sequencing, because I, I think that this is an, an issue that, that, that is often out there with us as we think about uh, climate financing uh, overall. So I would say in terms of timing, this has to happen in parallel. This is not a one-off, one-shot deal. You start and then you build confidence and you learn and you build trust and then it, it accelerates and you do more from there. Um, you can't start with one, it's, it's a game, you can't start with one person putting everything forward and, and then waiting for the other. And I think in terms of the climate finance, when people talk about climate finance, they're often meaning coming from government or multilateral yeah. development banks. People get over-focused on that because that is only a part of the solution. So when you're thinking about that, don't let that paralyze you, but make sure you're mobilizing the private sector finance with that climate finance and, and creating this virtuous cycle mm -hmm. from that. From that. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so, Luis, back to you. I mean, I'm trying to return this back to the central banking mm -hmm. space because there is going to be a lot of contestation. I think it's, it's already there. We spoke about some of the political economy trade-offs and uh, different policy priorities. Uh, and I've been noting multiple quotable quotes today. Uh, and, and one of the things, the, uh, the uh, the issues that was raised is maybe sometimes central banks are doing too much and there's a bit of overreach. <laughs> uh, and now central banks are in climate, are they not taking away the work that other policy makers ought to do so that they end up looking to central banks saying, well, the central banks will carry this forward as well. So, so the question to you, Luis, is um, should the central banks have a very narrow focus in thinking about their role in climate change and simply focus on the price stability and macro stability issues. I think we are seeing different approaches uh, among central banks. So we have some central banks that are very vocal. They're part of that integrated government machinery. Uh, but in other jurisdictions, there's a very siloed approach in terms of how central banks are, are, are thinking through some, some of the, the climate issues. So some reflections on that. Thank, thanks, Fungi. Uh, uh, indeed, I mean, this is a conference essentially about central bank, you know, so some people may be asking, well, why are we talking about climate change mitigation now? Uh, what is the implication of that for central banks? I'll go back to a point you made, uh, Fundi, at the very beginning, which is, I think we need to recognize that central banks are not in the driver's seat of this type of mm -hmm. policy. You know, all yeah. the instruments that I talked about, uh, Susie, I think a lot of the, 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 the uh, uh, reflections that you made show that uh, it's essentially governments that are playing the, 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 the key role um, in, uh, in, in deploying those instruments. But uh, central banks uh, are not, you know, they don't operate in a vacuum. There are so many aspects here that we've talked about that affect directly, um, uh, if you want, even narrow mandates of central banks. Uh, you know, material, the materialization of uh, physical risks, uh, you know, will affect uh, essentially how activity uh, evolves in an economy. 
Um, so it is something that is directly related to narrowly defined mandates of central banks. All this transformation that we are talking about in our economies will affect relative prices. So that will mm -hmm. be something that central banks obviously need to be concerned uh, about. Um, transition risks that could affect um, you know, how uh, essentially, um, you know, could create stranded assets in our economies. That's something that obviously affects how central banks uh, uh, think uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, all that. So, uh, you know, I could go on and on and think about the areas, the, the situations, the mechanisms where that would affect, uh, you know, activity and inflation in our economies. Huh? But there is always uh, other aspects of central banking uh, uh, operations, central bank operations, that are important here. Central banks have uh, enormous analytical capacity. Uh, so modeling all these, everything that we've been talking about, about uh, how you develop models that would assess uh, uh, you know, the link between individual policy instruments and emissions and impacts on the economy, central banks are you know, very well equipped uh, to also uh, think about uh, these issues and contribute to the, to the debate. Um, everything that has to do, for example, with understanding financial frictions in the, our economies that will affect the ability to find or mm -hmm. finance to be recycled in the course of transition, another area for central banks um, to, uh, uh, to think about. When it comes to financial stability, obviously mm -hmm. designing climate stress tests, you know, something that is to the core of central bank uh, uh, operations, thinking about climate scenarios that would affect uh, um, our uh, financial sectors in different ways uh, would be uh, part of a mandate of a central bank. So I think all that, you know, despite questions related to how mandates are narrowly defined, mm -hmm. uh, they are aspects that have to do uh, with how uh, central banks uh, operate. Um, so it is, it is obviously an area that, uh, that the engagement uh, of central banks will be important. You mentioned also, Fundi, at the beginning, you know, how it affects the different parts of government. And we see that the governance of climate change uh, policies mm -hmm. is, is very complex. It's different layers of government, it's different parts of the government at the same level. Uh, it's relationship with private sectors, with regulators, with monetary authorities. So obviously being part of that uh, broader uh, uh, governance arrangement uh, is extremely important uh, to make sure that uh, the transition is as smooth as possible so mm -hmm. that you, know, you don't have the type of shocks that could derail uh, the transition or could you know, end up with a costlier transition the need be is something that obviously, you know, concerns central governments very directly. Okay. Um, thank you. So let's turn to our audience. Uh, I've got three hands right here in the middle. We'll start with you, Kubin, uh, go to Prof. Harris, and then we'll come to you, Andres. Uh, thank you, Susie and, and Luis, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, l let me caveat my comment by a couple of points. Firstly, you know, I mean, climate change is a reality, and we've got one planet, and we've got a collective responsibility to deal with it. Second is that South Africa emits above the global average in its per capita sense, and South Africa has a, uh, should take an even greater commitment to reducing its CO2. And the last caveat is that I think the Just Energy Transition Program is a good one uh, and a good model and, and should be promoted. <laughs> On the 14th of August... Uh, this year, Raghuram Rajan, writing an op-ed in the FT, made the following points. He says that there's been no increase in transfers from advanced economies to emerging markets in the last decade. In fact, there's been a reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point he makes is that subsidies in advanced economies to industries to clean up has actually raised the costs of carbon mitigation and has actually held back the process in developing countries of mitigating uh, uh, carbon. And the third point he makes is that the carbon border adjustment mechanism in the European Union is likely to severely impact developing countries negatively, impact their economies, employment, and their output per capita, which is likely to hold back the, the process of greening the economy. So I, I'd like your views on that. You know, it's quite a strong statement, and it's not by me, and it's not by... The Communist Party, it's by Raghuram Rajan, right, who, who's a respected central banker, uh, saying that actually what the advanced world is doing is not working, is actually taking us backwards. Thanks. 
Thanks, Kubin. Uh, Lawrence? Thank, thank you very much, Luis and Susie, for those great presentations. Um, my, my point, I think, is particularly addressed to Susie. Susie, I, I, I very much welcome your, your holistic approach, which is very thought-provoking and you know, enables uh, people to engage with, with it at, different, at various levels, though so holistic. Um, I, I'm just taking the South African case, with, you know, the example you gave, you, you said, well used to illustrate your approach. Um, I'm curious as to what you would see as the role for our financial sector. I mean, you know, South Africa's got you know, strong banking sector, strong capital markets, mm -hmm. strong investment institutions, which have historically and continue to have a very powerful role in mobilizing savings and allocating savings. Um, uh, those savings have been uh, uh, oriented towards the, the, the building of a fossil fuel rich intensive uh, economy. Mm. Um, so as part of a holistic approach, what role would they have and how can their roles be changed? Oh, I should have reminded everyone to introduce themselves properly, mm. even though I'm, I know who they are. I, I apologize <laughs> intensely. I'm Lawrence Harris from SAAS University of London and from the Reserve Bank. Thank you. Andreas? Okay, I'm Andreas Lagerton. I'm here as a visiting research fellow to the FAB, and um, I'm also an academic economist uh, with uh, the University of Technology in, in Vienna. Now, I have, I have two, commission, uh, two questions, comments for both uh, speakers. Of course, first, the easier one, um, central banks are certainly not in the driver's seat for uh, pursuing climate change policies, but they are, as uh, Luis has uh, already uh, started to explain, at the receiving end. Now, I think this could be made more uh, transparent. I think it should be possible to calculate uh, what is the, <coughs> the consequence of climate change uh, policies um, measured in terms of some price index. Could be the, the GDP deflator, maybe that would be best suitable. So that would be my question whether OECD is having kind of efforts in, in this direction uh, underway. Now, for Susie, the <clears throat> what I'm a bit puzzled with is the issue uh, how this, uh, this very laudable uh, initiative <coughs> is based on, um, let's say, efficiency grounds. Yeah? In a very simplified uh, way, I would think that, let's say, the North is uh, emitting a lot, uh, the South is emitting less, South Africa being um, an exception. Yeah? So let's not get distracted by that. And therefore, equalizing abatement costs should mean that the North should be doing more for uh, climate change uh, mitigation. Yeah? And therefore, my um, empirical question would be, do you have some information that actually abatement costs in the South are lower than they, they are in the North? And maybe just un anecdotally, you, you might like to find another uh, fruit than the avocado for your stomach <laughs> because it's accused to be excessively water consuming. <laughs> it's also an environmental concern. Okay, thank you. So back to you both on some reflections. Who wants to start? I start? Okay. Yeah. Oh, great questions, thank you. Um, yes, it is depressing that um, transfers between the North and the South are not increasing. Um, we, we need to reverse that as much as we can, but it's also a reality that people are not willing to, to just suddenly open their wallets and be enormously generous. I wish they were, um, and I'll keep trying to encourage them too. Um, so part of that is getting people greater confidence that by making those transfers that they will really make a difference because there's a lot of scepticism um, about 
transfers in climate specifically, but even more generally. Um, in terms of subsidies raising cost, um, I don't know that that's true. It might be true in the short term. Particularly, I know that there are a lot of adverse effects from IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, in the very short term, but technology costs have fallen dramatically in so many aspects of this clean transition, and a lot of that work has been done in Europe, it's been done in the US. It hasn't necessarily fallen in Africa yet, because you have to localise and, and commercialise at a local scale as well, so there needs to be matching innovation and efforts here as well. Um, and yeah, CBAM is kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, if we don't find a way to uh, make this transition hap happen where the North helps the South and works with the South, then the North might well force it upon the South. And that is a much worse outcome uh, for everybody. Uh, and, and that is the direction that that's things like CBAM are potentially going. And I know the CBAM is deep being defined in such a way that it will exempt some countries, but it's not going to exempt South Africa or India, some of the important countries that still have an enormous number of vulnerable people. So, so I think this is, this is the core of the challenge that we're trying to address, but I don't underestimate how difficult that is. Um, Lawrence's question is the role for the South African financial sector. And um, I should admit, I know nothing about South Africa except what I've learned in the last three days. But I work a lot in Chile, which also has a lot of strength in its institutions. Um, and one of the things that they can really do is similar to what Louise said about reserve banks, that applying that knowledge and expertise to understanding what really will happen in the finance sector. So. Um, understanding what will happen with climate change itself so that people are not making investments that they, that they will later regret. Because this is, this, is not a, this is a new challenge. We don't know what climate change is going to look like, so it's very hard for us to apply standard tools. And we tend to look backwards at what has happened in the past, and that is not relevant in, in a lot of cases now. So get those smart brains applying to these problems um, and to the problems of, just, of transition as well, uh, making sure that people are really facing this in an honest way. Um, also, we need people in the finance sector, and one of the reasons that I'm in New York at the moment is to try and get people in the finance sector, because I'm not a financial economist, to design contracts, to do the financial engineering that brings together these different finance sources, but design contracts that work for Africa. All of the, de the contracts at the moment are written by lawyers in New York or in London or in, in Paris or somewhere. And, and they are systematically and subtly biased um, in, in all sorts of ways. So we need people to be counteracting that. Um, in terms of the efficiency benefits of transfer, so the first thing about transfer is that it, we're not going to get, in my opinion, we're not going to get to 1.5, let alone 2, uh, sorry, we're not going to get to to two, let alone 1.5 degrees in terms of limiting climate change unless we can have a large amount of finance transfer but also resource transfer. And climate change itself, is, it's like a huge externality. It is massively inefficient. So that's the biggest inefficiency that we're facing here. Um, in terms of equalising abatement costs, uh, the North has a lot of historical responsibility, but its emissions... Uh, costs of reducing emissions on the margin are now quite high. I mean, you look at the EU and the, the price of carbon and their emissions trading system, it has now skyrocketed. And that's an indication of how much it costs to accelerate reduction. They've done the easy stuff, they've done the things that can be done quickly, and now they're into sectors that have uh, capital that rolls over very slowly. And New Zealand is another example. Our electricity is almost 100% renewable now. Uh, our emissions now come from cars. Fleets roll over slowly. And they come from cows. And cows are things that I have noticed in South Africa who really like eating. So this is, we're, we're into the difficult stuff. We are trying to solve it. Um, but just because the North can't do a lot more fast themselves, they could do more, but at enormous cost, doesn't mean that they can't contribute. There are two different ways you can contribute. One is by paying, the other is by doing. The South has the ability to do, though there are a lot of institutional barriers, 
the North has the ability to pay. This is, this is potential for trade. And I'm sorry about the avocado. I use lychees in China, um, and if someone can suggest a good fruit for Africa, that would be very welcome. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Luis. Th thanks, Rudy. Fa thanks, uh, uh, Kuben and Andreas and Lawrence for these questions. I think on your point, Kuben, you're, you're, you're mentioning extremely important uh, issues that uh, I think, like Susie, I think a lot of work more on tracking those flows, part of informing the analysis on that. Uh, but I think all the issues that you raised um, boil down to uh, international policy coherence. So understanding the spillovers across borders of domestic policies, I think sometimes we uh, tend to devote more resources to understanding spillovers within economies rather than across mm -hmm. borders. So there is a lot of modeling information, mm -hmm. a lot of work that needs to be done there to inform that discussion in ways that, uh, that can be done in a more solid, uh, solid basis. Um, you mentioned the issue of C-bands. I mean, one uh, very important part of this analysis is what is the carbon intensity of goods that are traded, for example? I mean, how can we measure that to be sure that we know uh, what, uh, what is at stake uh, in international trade? analyzing, for example, the impact of the financial spillovers that will be so important in terms of dealing with transition risks um, um, in the process of transforming economies moving forward. So I think these are extremely important uh, questions, questions that require still a lot of analysis, a lot of uh, you know, ability to provide evidence in areas that can be constructive uh, for this international dialogue and international dialogue, you know, make sure that opportunities exist and that countries seize those opportunities uh, in different fora, in different geometries, uh, to make sure that uh, those questions uh, are addressed uh, along with the domestic uh, issues that, uh, that were the ones I was essentially focusing on, on my, uh, uh, in my presentation. Um, Andreas, you mentioned the issues of, uh, of uh, you know, gauging empirically effects. Uh, I think you, you probably remember from your days at the OECD, uh, models like ENV linkages, the long-term model of the, of the economics department. I think those are all um, instruments that we have that we are using. Uh, we are also seeing that uh, other international organizations are doing uh, the same, central banks are doing the same. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the process of doing that, we are seeing that there are lots of gaps there as well. For example, how can we reconcile the evidence that comes out of sectoral models? Uh, Susie, mm -hmm. I think you would ag agree with that. Uh, when it comes to analyzing impacts uh, for economies uh, as a whole, um, aggregate models, macroeconomic models, um, sometimes uh, give you uh, very different evidence uh, when compared to mm. sectoral models. Mm. Uh, understanding the situations where those different types of models uh, would be most, uh, most useful. Considerations about, uh, you know, when you look at certain impacts of those mitigation policies, uh, when can we rely on ex post analysis that basically is derived from a history uh, of interventions uh, in a given area? When should we think of uh, ex ante models where, uh, you know, we don't rely on uh, elasticities that are estimated, but when we try to you know, uh, gauge the effect of technological change uh, that has affected the past moving forward and so on. Uh, in many cases, um, is GDP the right metric to look at? Sometimes you need to look at employment, sometimes you need to look at uh, other uh, outcome or other performance indicators uh, uh, to measure the, the impact of policies and effect uh, of policies. So with all that, um, what I'm trying to say probably, Andreas, is that there is a huge agenda uh, for work uh, uh, here. Um, a huge agenda of work that covers many different areas of policy, uh, not only the ones that I mentioned, that Susie mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, but also yeah. uh, areas where, um, you know, impacts or effects may be very different in different types of countries. I mean, you mentioned, Susie, and I, uh, an important point about, you know, the, uh, the differences in abatement costs. I mean, we mm -hmm. see that that there are differences there, and there are those differences that are changing over time uh, as well. So being able to exploit the type of understanding what the differences are, what is driving those differences, how we are applying that to models uh, that are essentially there to, uh, you know, uh, project uh, uh, the behavior of economies in the future, 
that's all part of this huge agenda that I think we all need to face uh, together, uh, not only mm -hmm. international organizations, central banks, governments, uh, uh, um, uh, all the relevant actors uh, that, are, that have a stake uh, in, this, uh, in this space. Okay, so I just want to check if there are any other burning questions in the room. I see one hand and then I'll go online and then that, that will be a wrap. Um, go ahead. Um, Madeleine Sessions from Denka Capital. The panel's title was the role of climate change adaption and mitigation in economic growth. We've heard a lot about costs, we've heard a lot about taxes. Can we have a sense of what the economic growth opportunity is from adaptation and mitigation policy. Thank you. Tuli? Sure, there's a couple of questions here, but I'm going to couple. choose two. Um, the first one is from Sanisha Pakrasamri, again from Momentum Investment. And she asks, renewables have the potential to bring about a new type of waste material, example batteries, that might not be of high value or have little reuse alternatives. Do we have a handle on the extent of these costs and are they baked into the estimates of the financing needs and financing gaps? Then Emran Velodia from WITS has asked, Susie Kerr's cooperative model looks fine in theory in a world where geopolitics does not exist. Unfortunately, we live in the real world where geopolitics drives much of the climate change agenda, as is evident in the slow progress at the various COPs. How does geopolitics change her framework? And I said COPs, but I mean COPs, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, back to my panel. Susie, you go. So I can, I can start, and in terms of the growth potential, um, this might sound negative, but I think the adaptation is about avoiding damage to growth, uh, not necessarily about an upside, and, but the, if we don't adapt and we don't stop climate change, that could have really devastating impacts for, for growth. Um, in terms of mitigation, there is growth potential from being able to use some of the more sophisticated technologies, from having better uh, access to electricity, but also uh, more efficient, more reliable electricity. Um, in terms of battery, in terms of batteries, um, the the models are all focused on recycling because they use. Uh, Minerals that are relatively scarce, um, and, and currently a lot of the battery technologies are dependent on those minerals. There are new batteries being developed in labs now that have all sorts of different approaches, but, but none of those are yet commercialised. Um, so it's all about recycling those minerals, um, and I think the cost of those, in of that recycling, um, relative to the, the total system, is considered to be pretty small. But um, I. I don't know specific numbers on that. Um, yes, geopolitics is awful, um, and it makes cooperation incredibly hard. Uh, it's, the question is, what's the alternative? We don't have a global government, so we can't just impose regulations like you can within a country. We can't make compliance instruments. International agreements are cooperative. So we have to work as well as we can in the context of the geopolitics. And that's why I think it's important for countries to be able to choose who they work with. Some countries are very happy working with China. Others would only work with the United States. Others will want to work with Europe. And people can work with different places, even though China and the US are struggling in terms of geopolitical issues, they still both care about climate and they're both trying to make a difference on climate. So this may be an area where there is potential maybe for them to cooperate, but at least not to get in each other's way. Yeah. Thank, thanks, uh, uh, Fundi. On, on economic growth, that's really a very good question because you know we tended to focus on the downside, you know, on the costs associated with mitigation and all that. I, I think we can also think about uh, uh, upside risks. You know, the impact that all this reallocation that we are talking about, we are talking about uh, you know required transformations in our economies uh, that uh, could generate productivity gains, that could create efficiency gains in our, in our economies. Uh, for all that to materialize, obviously, you know, the transition will have to be as smooth, as frictionless as possible. So there are lots of moving parts that will have to be aligned here uh, so that all that potential can be, uh, uh, can be materialized. But it's also good uh, for us uh, to think uh, of the costs 
uh, as well, because uh, it uh, you know, frames the mind of policymakers uh, to make sure that they can mitigate those costs as much uh, as possible. You know, and there are lots of policy instruments that can be uh, used for that, support for technological change, for innovation, uh, being one of them, you know, making sure that the governments facilitate uh, this uh, transition of workers that will have to migrate from uh, sectors uh, that will be dying in the process of the transition to sectors uh, where there are greater potential uh, gains and opportunities and so on. So important to think of that as well. Geopolitics, just a word to add to what Susie uh, mentioned in terms of uh, uh, you know, the policy lessons of geopolitical risk. I think it has been very useful. Uh, the war in Ukraine, I think, has uh, uh, raised a lot of uh, attention to issues about the vulnerabilities uh, of su supply chains at the global scale, issues related uh, to essentially risks that are uh, associated uh, with uh, critical raw materials, many of which are extremely important for the green transition, and how we manage uh, uh, supply chains uh, overall in ways that are consistent uh, with all the good things about having diversified the supply chains uh, as we have seen uh, over the last few decades, uh, but also make sure that you uh, can uh, guard against and minimize risks associated with those, uh, vo those vulnerabilities. So uh, uh, being attentive to that type of risk as well uh, is part uh, of uh, the type uh, of uh, analysis that policymakers need to make uh, when they take decisions in areas that uh, will be so fundamental for the transition moving forward. Okay, well, thank you very much to you both uh, for your insights uh, and also the response to the questions. Now, an important reason to have stayed for this session is for the next announcement that I am going to make. Uh, for those of our guests who have confirmed their attendance uh, at the cocktail this evening, it's taking place at the Zeik uh, Mokka Museum at the waterfront. If you have been unable to confirm please make your way to the uh, help desks that we have outside the room. Uh, someone will be able to assist you. Uh, so if you are making your way on your own, if you've got your own hired vehicle, you can go straight uh, to the museum, but you will need to have this card with you. Uh, if you're making the way on your own, there's parking at the facility, but don't forget the, a card that looks like this, which is your entry stub. Uh, into the museum. Uh, for those of you who will uh, be departing with us, uh, there is also a bus that will be available outside uh, the CTIC 2, which is this area that we are in, as well as another one on the side of the Western Hotel. Again, you will need to have uh, your tag and in there is a, you will see there are two bus tickets. Uh, so the pink one is for today, uh, and then the other one is for tomorrow. Uh, so please hand your bus ticket uh, when you get into the bus, that will be required. And when you arrive at the Zeit uh, Museum, you will need to give them your voucher to make um, your way into the museum. And we will be at the museum until 9 p.m. And that's when we are making our way back here. For tomorrow morning, just as a reminder, there is a PhD session that starts at 8.15. For those who are interested, it is on the second floor in the DAISY room. Uh, if you look at your program and if you have the app, uh, you'll be able to get the details of the PhD session tomorrow. That begins at 8.15. And then we will reconvene in this room again to commence with session five at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, both. We managed